There is no planet B, which is why we as civil engineering professionals must account for climate adaptation and resilience on our projects. In today's episode, I have with me Emery Lee. She is a climate adaptation and resilience lead for the Ramble Group in New York. And Emery is gonna to talk to us about how we as civil engineers can account for climate adaptation on our projects to make our projects more successful for our clients and for the world as a whole. Now, before we dive in with Emery, I do wanna just highlight our sponsor for today's episode, PPI. Before we dive in, we'd like to recognize our sponsor for this episode, PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the FE and PE exams. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the FE and PE exams the first time. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all the options available for FE and PE exam prep. Now let's dive into today's episode. All right, now I'd like to welcome on our guest for today. Emery Lee is the Climate Adaptation and Resilience Lead for Ramble Group in New York. Emery, welcome to the Civil Engineering Podcast. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. This is a, a, certainly a, a topic that I think our listeners are going to be excited to learn about. So just to get us going here in your own words, tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do in general on a daily basis. Sure, I'd be glad to. Yeah, so um, yeah, as, as Anthony mentioned, uh, my name is Emery Lee and I'm a climate adaptation and resilience lead in New York working for Ramble Group. So um, yeah, it, it what, what that translates to day to day is, um, you know, I'm, I'm working for a global engineering and infrastructure consultancy headquartered in Denmark, but, you know, operating around the world, um, you know, uh, they're growing a pretty robust uh, practice in the Americas. And um, I'm fortunate in the sense that the work that, um, you know, keeps me very busy uh, is all related to sort of how uh, can clients um, whether that's public sector clients or private sector clients, um, you know, uh, adapt, retool, uh, retrofit, and or build from new, uh, you know, more resilient uh, and uh, adaptive infrastructure uh, or assets. So, um, yeah, it, it really is about thinking about the impacts of climate change on our built environment every day, uh, which, which can be stressful at times. It creates a little anxiety, I'm not gonna lie, but um, yeah, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm working constantly with uh, interdisciplinary teams surrounded by engineers. Um, I'm actually an urban planner myself, but spent my entire career working with engineers hand in glove, as they say, or hand in hand. So yeah, um, it's uh, uh, pretty exciting. That's great. It does sound like an exciting topic. So for our listeners not too familiar with this area, what is climate adaptation and resilience? Yeah, so um, I, I, the first thing that I think of um, before I go into definitions of climate adaptation and, and resilience is, um, you know, I, I always have the thought there is no planet B. Um, and, you know, it's, it's something that um, you know, the, the company that I work for, um, you know, it's, it's a philosophy that everyone in the company kind of understands um, and, and adopts universally. Um, so I think about my own personal mission, which is to sort of create cities, places um, that are more livable, resilient, and better prepared for climate change, because that's, that's our new reality. Uh, we're, we're, we're experiencing climate change currently. It's, it's not something that's coming in the future. It's happening now. Um, so, you know, formally speaking, um, you know, if I were to define climate adaptation, it's, you know, involves assessing the effects of climate change on the safety, health, and welfare of our societies and populations. And then how does that translate to being able to, from a resilience perspective, um, a capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or challenges posed uh, by sort of the impacts of climate change, um, and, you know, specifically climate resilience is sort of, I think, the capability of anticipating, preparing for, and responding to hazardous events and disturbances uh, caused by climate change. Um, so I, I think there's, there's a causal relationship ultimately, too, between climate adaptation and resilience. So, so 
your your ability or inability to adapt will have a direct impact on sort of the capacity you have to to or you know you an organization uh, you know uh, a government uh, to to be more resilient in the face of climate change. That's really interesting. So essentially, it's your your job and your company's role is to help your clients to adapt to this climate change and be resilient, you know, be proactive, resilient with their projects to be able to exactly. adapt to it and, and the needs of it, which is, which is awesome. So, right. so let's take it like one step further. I know you kind of hinted at this a little bit, but so how do climate adaptation and resilience then connect to civil engineering projects? If you could speak on that a little bit. Sure. Sure. Um, so when I, when I think about, you know, climate adaptation and resilience in the context of, uh, you know, the world that civil engineers operate in, right, on, you know, it's, it's infrastructure, the built environment, public works, things outside the building envelope, underground, right, along the, the edges of our uh, land, right, um, and, and also, you know, sort of everything uh, that goes into um, supporting a lot of the critical services that we all enjoy, like roads and sidewalks and uh, fresh water, energy, things of that nature, buildings that we can go inside. And, um, you know, all those things um, are vulnerable to, you know, a more volatile and changing climate. I mean, and, and a lot of the, again, infrastructure and the, the stuff that I just described has sort of um, longer sort of useful lives, so useful, useful lifetime horizons. So, I mean, infrastructure built 50 plus years ago, right? Uh, maybe nearing the end of its useful life. So thinking about the design criteria used at the time uh, to, to sort of build what we in, what we have now, sort of our bridges, roadways, roadways, major major infrastructure systems and networks, um, you know, is, is particularly vulnerable to the, the climate conditions we have today and will have in the future. Um, so I think, um, you know, it's about, Planners and engineers and design professionals, um, you know, have a critical role to play in ensuring that our societies function properly in, in that way with respect to how we how how we operate uh, day to day. Uh, so, um, you know, I think civil engineers can have a major influence on the extent to which the infrastructure that's either you know reaching the end of its useful life and or that will depend on through the next 50 plus years to the end of the century and beyond, um, you know, the extent to which that infrastructure can withstand and or recover from, um, you know, climate related stressors. Interesting. And, and just so I can understand a little bit more and, and help our listeners understand again, kind of like your role, mm -hmm. for example, on like a civil or an infrastructure project, mm -hmm. if a civil engineer is working on an infrastructure project, let's just say, and they do not have a uh, climate adaptation or resilient consultant or professional working with them. Mm. Is that where someone like you would come in potentially and be called in to take a look at the project and help them to understand what the potential climate adaptation risks are on it and how they can think about that in the planning stages and design stages and the long-term maintenance stages of a project? Yes, absolutely. That's that's definitely one scenario. You know, I mean, we we sometimes get um, asked to partner by other engineering firms. When I say we, uh, Ramble, so therefore me um, as, a, as an employee of, of Ramble, you know, we often get um, added to a project team or a project uh, for our firm's particular expertise in um, sort of uh, the ways in which. Uh, maybe a traditional infrastructure project or civil engineering project could be um, modified or tailored to sort of be to increase resilience, right? Um, and and what what Ramble can offer, and, and someone like me, um, you know, the team that I oversee can offer um, is sort of access to um, the climate science, climate data. Um, we we often perform climate risk assessments, um, which are you know. Um, uh, quantitative uh, assessments of vulnerability, uh, likelihood of events happening, consequences of those events, and then the, the calculated risk associated with a particular climate hazard. And so um, being able to do that sort of evaluation and put, put uh, next to sort of civil engineers who have this sort of technical design criteria and that understanding of 
okay, you know, like we need certain loads, we need to have certain, uh, you know, design to a certain elevation. And, you know, um, there's, there's lots of considerations and depends on the scope of a given civil engineering project, but we're certainly working, um, you know, side by side with, with engineers. And, and it may be also recommending that, um, you know, a certain accreditation standard uh, be pursued, whether that's in vision, uh, or whether it's if it's a waterfront project, um, there's a uh, the wedge certification which has grown out of New York here. Uh, but I think they're actually starting to certify projects nationwide. I don't, I don't know if you've heard of the wedge certification before, but it's a waterfront edge design guideline. So more of a focus mm -hmm. on coastal resilience and, and coastal engineering projects. But um, certainly, you know, we're, we're called in to sort of like, you know say if there weren't any considerations for adaptation or resilience on the table yet um you know ideally we're coming in early on in the in the project phase phasing and you know that's um you know i, I mean and, and the ideal scenario i guess would also be that you know sort of a client approaches us and or you know a group of firms to say we have a, a big project here we have you know climate change in mind can you help us scope this out uh, and or, you know, we're, we're, do, we're responding to a lot of RFEIs lately. So requests for expressions of interest and the clients are, I think, trying to lean on the industry a bit more, it seems. I'm just noticing this trend to sort of say, you know, help us scope the projects so that we have, you know, climate adaptation and resilience baked in to sort of what then becomes, you know, a design uh, solicitation or procurement. Interesting. And so one more question on that. Would you say that there are specific projects that would more common require your expertise, like obviously like coastal or waterfront, mm -hmm. if I'm a civil engineer and I'm working on projects, mm -hmm. or is it not necessarily limited to projects like that? Yeah, really good question. Um, you know, I, I think over the last decade, and, and I particularly work in, you know, the New York metropolitan area. So this market geography in the last decade, there has been a tremendous focus on coastal. And I mean, if you're on the East coast of the United States as well, like down to the Gulf, um, you know, every hurricane season, I mean, we, we've had <clears throat> over the last 10 years, several extremely damaging, catastrophic, uh, you know, uh, storms. Uh, and, and so, you, you know, I think from a federal funding standpoint too, there's been a lot of investment from FEMA, from HUD in um, <clears throat> sort of repair and recovery from sort of coastal uh, driven, um, you know, climate events. And I would say though, we're also starting to notice more of a focus on just extreme weather in general. So whether it's extreme precipitation, um, I don't know if you're familiar with this term, Anthony, but it's something that we at Ramble work a lot in. And then I'm hearing more and more are, um, are sort of like pluvial flooding events. So cloud bursts is the sort of the term that um, has arisen. Um, so um, very heavy extreme rainfall in a very short amount of time. So short duration uh, uh, rainfall events. And um, we had one of those in New York City last year at the end of the summer that was pretty devastating. Um, there was loss of life. Um, tremendous sort of million, millions of dollar, dollars of damage statewide. Um, so it, it really took a toll. So we are starting to understand that it's not just about coastal storms, but there are also, uh, you know, other climate uh, hazards that require serious consideration. That's great. And, yeah. and really the point of these questions is, you know, one of our goals with the show is to make sure that civil engineering professionals can be as well-rounded as possible. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. there's something that they can take out of the episode, maybe that's a red flag for them to say, hey, yeah. you know, maybe we need to get a climate adaptation resilience mm -hmm. professional involved on this project. Or they can go to their client and express maybe it'd be yes. good to have a conversation with someone with that mm -hmm. expertise. I think it can just help them to bring more value to their clients potentially. And, and you know, there's a potential, obviously, with some of the funding coming down the way that mm -hmm. there can be quite a few a uh, number of infrastructure projects across the U.S. here in the next few years and beyond. So um, 100%. definitely one of the reasons here yeah. that we were talking with Emery on these points. So Emery, what are some of the key points would you say that civil engineers should know about climate adaptation <laughs> and resilient infrastructure? Yeah, key points. Um, yeah, I mean, at the risk of oversimplifying, I mean, maybe there are many 
uh, design and sort of practicing engineering professionals that are already that are already aware of this or have that awareness. Uh, but for those who might not, um, my sort of one of the key takeaways I would I would say or key points is that um, climate adaptive design or sometimes you hear climate adjusted design criteria, you know that. They, they should be the standard design criteria now and moving forward. I mean, it's going to be, you know, design criteria and climate adaptive design standards. And if you want to zoom out and just call it an overall approach to design and engineering, I mean, it's going to be iterative. You know, we have science, we have climate projections out to 2050, 2080, you know, now um, that informs a lot of the work that um, we do with our clients. Uh, but, but again, it's going to be something that needs to be revisited over and over again. Um, and, and that's just part of the diligence, right? That's just part of the, you know, ensuring preparedness uh, and, and, and adaptation. It's constant, constant change, you know, evolution, essentially. And so um, another key point I would say is that, um, and this sort of is maybe reiterating what I just said, but it is a necessity. Like it's, I don't know, I, I don't see it anymore as like a, a nice to have kind of thing or a value add or a um, like an adult, uh, you know, it, it's like, it's a must. And I, I, that's why, again, I think my previous point about clients reaching out and sort of approaching procurement processes and, and purchasing processes differently in how they scope their, you know, engineering jobs now is like, they are sort of testing the waters with the industry, gathering knowledge from the industry and then sort of weaving it into their scopes um, that ultimately become you know, an RFP or a design build or something like that. So um, I would say you know, it definitely really needs to be the standard way we do things. It's absolutely necessary. And I, I think I said this before, so I don't wanna to be too repetitive, but I do think the engineering discipline can lead the way um, you know, in, in sort of championing climate adaptive design, um, you know, advocating for resilient infrastructure being, you know, again, sort of the, the baseline uh, for, for how we approach our uh, infrastructure and design jobs. No, that's great. And I would hope that some of the larger companies or the larger projects um, out there today do have processes in place where climate adaptation is just one of the things on their mm -hmm. kind of checklist that they have to go through on every project. Like you said, mm -hmm. it's not just an extra, it's something that's right. a standard thing that we consider. Yeah. Um, you know, we can only hope that that's the case. And, you know, obviously hopefully by having Emory on the podcast here, we can bring some more attention to it for those of you out there that maybe you know, don't have that yet. So Emory, let's talk a little bit about potential jobs or roles mm -hmm. within climate adaptation. And one of the things I always like to mention on the podcast is I feel like there are so many opportunities in the world of engineering that there are just new jobs kind of popping up in a sense every day. Um, and we don't always know what all the potential roles or potential job opportunities are out there. Can you speak to what some of them might be in the world of uh, climate adaptation? Sure, sure can. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I think, you know, um, first thing I'll say is just that there are more jobs in this field now than ever before. Um, and, you know, for me, uh, joining a, a firm like Ramble, um, which is, you know, it's global, uh, like 16,000 employees, 16, sorry, one 6,000 employees. Um, you know, I, I, it was very eye opening to me to see just uh, the types of roles um, that, that are open and available to engineers, it's, whether it's civil engineers or water resource engin engineers, environmental engineers. Um, you know, the, I've come from a background of working in uh, a market geography and for engineering firms that, um, you know, worked on a lot of very heavy civil jobs. Um, I don't want to use the word traditional, but just sort of, um, you know, uh, very, um, yeah, I, I'll say traditional jobs of, um, you know, typologies of infrastructure projects. And, you know, I'm starting to see more and more now um, people with job titles like climate adaptation engineer or uh, climate uh, adaptation specialist. Um, you know, I work with a lot of folks who've built careers in civil engineering, water resources, engineering, environmental engineering, but a lot of them are now sort of working mostly on, yeah, adaptive infrastructure, integrated infrastructure projects. Um, so they're leveraging their very extensive careers. I mean, some of these 
my colleagues are 30, 30, 35 plus years in the field um, and are now sort of, um, you know, working on designs for, uh, you know, resilient infrastructure jobs that are pretty large. Um, so I, I think, you know, the types of roles, you know, do require a base of, you know, knowledge in sort of a traditional engineering discipline, but um, through training, education, and just sort of on the job exposure. Um, I think, you know, there, there's this sort of, um, I don't want to say transformation, but I think there, I have seen, you know, many colleagues sort of go through this transformation of having a whole other knowledge and skill set uh, that, that's driven by the need for climate adaptation and resilient infrastructure work. Uh, so that, that's been great to see. And, you know, companies like ours, um, and then the companies um, that, you know, work in the same space as we do, are really looking to hire folks who have an interest in, um, you know, that sort of field, I guess. That's great. And, and just one last question here for you on this topic. Is there any uh, additional education or any other mm. advice that you have for someone who maybe is in the engineering world and wants to get more into climate adaptation mm. and resilience? Is there training programs? Is there maybe advanced degrees that you're aware of? Just wondering if someone's mm. like, oh, this sounds interesting to me. I may want to explore this more. If there's anything else you can share with them. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm definitely aware of uh, some training and sort of continuing education, executive education resources. Um, I mean, if you're in the United States, I know the ASCE offers that. Um, and uh, as far as, I mean, if, if you have the opportunity to, to go back to school um, in a more formal way, there are um, higher ed degrees. I mean, I, mean, I know that um, the, the Yale School of Environment has a particular master's with a focus on um, it's, it's actually like climate infrastructure and engineering. Um, and then uh, I believe um, Columbia University has the, the, their new sort of climate uh, program, um, their sort of climate university. Um, so yeah, I mean, I have several colleagues who have um, availed themselves of those types of resources. Uh, and I mean, I would say as far as sort of advice goes, um, seeking out those resources for sure. I mean, that can only give you a leg up if you're looking to work sort of in the, the climate adaptation space, um, you know, but, but also just thinking about interdisciplinary collaboration, the types of projects you might be working on or involved in if you work for a firm or you work for city government or a governmental authority, you know, looking into other either business units or arms of your organization and say, you know, is anyone working on this sort of thing? Um, and then being able to sort of uh, vocalize that you're interested in working in sort of resilient infrastructure and adaptation. I mean, that's, that's um, you know, I, I would certainly encourage that because all of the, all of the teams and projects that I touch are, it's, it's, interdisciplinary by nature, you, you can't work in silos. Um, so we need, we need, we need everybody. Well, that's great. And I, listen, I think, one, I think an important thing for everyone in their careers is to, of course, work on things that they're passionate about, things that they enjoy working on. But I do certainly feel that someone with a civil engineering background, if you can add some education, certification, yeah. knowledge around climate adaptation and resilience, mm -hmm. it can certainly be a, a great combination for you in terms of, again, serving your clients, making sure your projects are addressing climate change, which we all know is a real issue. And so I appreciate all the information that Emery has shared here. All right, so we're going to take a quick break here, and then we're going to come back with Emery. And we're going to finish up by putting her on the civil engineering hot seat and asking her a couple of career-related questions. But before we do that, a quick word from our sponsor, Menard. This video is also brought to you by Menard USA. Menard USA is a specialty ground improvement contractor that works nationally, providing design-build ground improvement solutions at sites with problematic soils. Menard works closely with civil, structural, and geotechnical engineers to minimize foundation costs for wide ranges of soil conditions, structure types, and loading conditions. To learn more about Menard USA or for help on your next project, please visit www.menardusa.com. All 
All right, we are back with Emery Lee. Emery is a climate adaptation and resilience lead for Ramble Group in New York. We had a great conversation around climate adaptation and resilience and how it fits into civil engineering projects and um, how Emery kind of works on some of those types of projects and assists in some of these projects. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to switch it up a little bit. Emery, we're going to ask you a couple of last career-related questions. You ready to go? Yeah. All right. So first question, do you have any specific rituals that you practice every day, whether it's a morning routine or a lunchtime routine or just something that you do consistently on a daily basis that has contributed to your success? Yeah, um, I, I would say, um, you know, I, I try every day to connect with nature in some form, uh, whether that's through jogging, mostly through jogging, running outside, walking, if I'm not up for the jog. Um but yeah, to me, it, it's very important to do that. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm someone again who, uh, you know, I focus on the natural environment, climate, uh, and uh, you know, part of what I, I didn't necessarily mention this before, but part of the approach uh, for climate adaptation and resilient infrastructure that I'm really passionate about is nature-based solutions and nature-based approaches to addressing. Um, you know, sort of the concerns we have around our infrastructure um, and, you know, the impacts of climate change. So I don't know if it's just a reminder to me of my mission of, you know, trying to advance that approach, but yeah, um, if I don't, if I don't get outside um, early uh, in some way, it, 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 I definitely notice it. Um, and, and I mean, you mentioned consistently on a daily basis. I mean, I, you know, I live on the East Coast, so it's not, something I get to do every single day, but I often surf very early in the morning. Um, so being able to get out and do that early surf session is also something that kind of helps uh, keep me uh, motivated and refreshed. That's great. That's awesome. I think you're the first person that answered that question with surfing. So that's cool. <laughs> cool. And a couple hundred episodes. Um, all right. Is there one book that you might recommend that you found to be extremely helpful in your professional or personal development it could be climate related could not be is there just something that stands out for you hey I read this book and it was really helpful for me yeah 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 um so so it's actually a book of essays and there's one particular essay that really stuck with me uh I mean I read the whole book of essays it's um it's this book of essays is called the art of the commonplace agrarian es essays by Wendell Berry um, and Wendell Berry is, um, you know, uh, from Kentucky, actually. Um, and and I, strangely, and the little known fact about myself, I was actually born in Kentucky, but grew up in sort of the Cincinnati metropolitan area. So I don't know, maybe it's that like, you know, Midwestern slash like, you know, Kentucky connection there that resonated. But um, he's also a particularly eloquent writer. And he has an essay called A Native Hill. Um, and for me, when the first time I read it, I just, it was so powerful, so impactful, talks about the power of place um, and, you know, humans concern or lack thereof for places and then how we treat them and, and you know, thinking about the future. And so, so for me, it just really uh, sparked, I guess, an interest in thinking about the future in the way that we build things and, and yeah, thinking about the natural world. Um, it's very important to me that we, as a human race, I guess, uh, consider how we can better integrate, you know, our built environment with the natural realm. I just think that integration is very critical to how we uh, exist uh, or continue to exist uh, here on this planet. And so, yeah, I don't know. That, that for me, reading A Native Hill was like very formative. Um, in that sort of my understanding of that. That's great. Awesome. All right. So thinking back on your managers of the past, and you don't, we're not asking you to name specific names, but if you think of your favorite manager or managers, what is it that made them your favorite? Just trying to think about in our world of, you know, infrastructure, engineering, you know, what are some of the characteristics that great managers typically exhibit? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would start with, um, you know, a genuine passion for the work that uh, they're doing and that or I'm doing and the team is doing. I mean, I think um, seeing a passion and an energy in a manager, a supervisor is really important. 
uh, to you know motivating staff. And it definitely was important for me in terms of my own motivation. Um, I think also just a level level headed. I don't know if I can say that, but sort of a yeah even keel, just a, a demeanor and approach to things. I mean, I, I think um, I'm not saying you know emotionless because you know passion somehow also does involve like a certain degree of emotion uh, showing. But I think um, just in terms of being very like stable and consistent, um, I think has been a feature that I've really appreciated in my past managers. Um, Two other things I would say is uh, just a manager that's recognized my unique value and um, acted as my ally and advocate in sort of the workplace has been helpful. I mean, I've been involved with um, managers where it's been a, you know, we've been a small team um, trying to do something very big. And, um, you know, I think uh, my favorite manager, I've had a, a few favorites, um, have really been able to understand where I can add the most value and then also have been able to sort of um, help me accomplish what I'm seeking to accomplish instead of just saying like, hey, you're on your own, like, good luck. Um, so that's, yeah, that's how I would respond to that question. That's great. That's awesome. All right, last question. You've worked with a number of civil engineering professionals throughout your career. I know that. If you happen to get into an elevator with a younger civil engineering professional and you had maybe 30 to 40 seconds with that person, what advice would you give them, career advice would you give them yeah. based on your career so far and your work in this field? Yeah, I would say that first and foremost, pay it forward in every way you can, uh, whether that's through mentoring others volunteering your time, giving free advice, uh, making connections or introductions to people. Um, you know, that, that I cannot underscore the importance of that, of paying it forward um, and networking, networking. I mean, I, I networking's not for everyone. <laughs> I realize that, uh, but if, and I, you know, I'm actually, I'm an introvert. Um, so I, I find it challenging, but um, it, it really does the, the, the Dividends, I mean, it just, it's exponentially valuable, um, pays back um, many, many times over, um, just investing that energy and networking, connecting with people, reaching out. Um, I know it might feel hard for some to, to sort of take that first step, but once you break that threshold and you kind of start to do it, it gets easier. And then in a way it kind of becomes self-sustaining uh, because you have that network, people reach out to you, you can, you know, leverage that network in certain ways. So yeah, paying it forward, networking, and think about building your own personal brand. Um, I might, we could go on forever about what that means, but uh, I, it, I boil it down to what makes you unique as a professional or as an engineering professional. Um, and then, you know, make sure you understand what you're passionate about. Um, so yeah, that would be my, my advice. Awesome. All right, well, Emery Lee, Climate Adaptation and Resilience Lead for Ramble Group in New York. I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us here on the Civil Engineering Podcast. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me, Anthony. This was great. Uh, very much appreciate it. And I'm open to any follow-up questions uh, if any listeners write in um, after the episode. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Emery. We put out episodes like this on a weekly basis to help engineers become more well-rounded so they can become better managers and leaders. Please consider subscribing to our channel here so that we can help you engineer your own success. I'll see you next week.